Good morning and welcome to worship with St. Paul's United Church of Christ in Woodstock, Virginia. No matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. And here is wherever we are in this time of COVID, worshiping in our cars, our living rooms, our bedrooms, on the road or in our houses. We are the body of Christ. And when we gather in Jesus' name, Jesus promises us that he is with us. I just want to make one announcement this morning. On Saturday, February 20th, our consistory is offering a repurposing workshop from, 11, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon with an hour's break for lunch. It will be a virtual workshop. And what's it all about? Well, what's our congregation's mission? What are our congregation's distinctive gifts for ministry? What needs does our community have? You see, in today's world, churches need to understand their purpose and their why in order to be faithfully effective. This workshop process can help our church make sure that our mission, our why, our assets, our people, gifts, and property, and our community's needs are in alignment. This workshop is going to describe and teach us tools, including online databases about all aspects of our Woodstock community so that we have an intentional process to assure that alignment. There's also going to be examples shared of how a few United Church of Con UCC congregations transformed their lives and their mission and their community presence through the use of their buildings and campus. I ask that you would save the date and that you would call the church office to let us know that you plan to attend. Details about that will follow once we know you're attending. Please join with me in prayer. Holy God, speak with authority in our lives. Speak to us and do and to what is in us so that we might be whole. Speak to us with love, with hope, and with strength so that we might hear you and know deep inside that we are your people and that you are our God. This we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Good morning, children. I want to talk about teachers, good teachers, this morning. Suppose you want to learn how to build stuff out of wood. Who would be the best teacher? Well, yeah, you're right. The best teacher would be someone who was an experienced carpenter. A carpenter spends many hours measuring and sawing and nailing pieces of wood together. Many of us, when we try to hammer a nail in place, bend the nail so it doesn't go in straight, or we miss the nail altogether. Let's see how I do here today. Ah, shoot, I missed it. All right, got it. Oh, it's going crooked already. My husband tells me that his grandfather was a great carpenter and he could hammer the nail with one pound. Boom, and it went all the way in. Well, when you watch a good carpenter at work, there's no doubt that she knows what she's doing. She swings the hammer with power. She knits, hits the nail squarely on the head and drives it easily into the wood. She is an authority in working with wood and is able to show others how to do it as well. When Jesus lived on earth, he was a teacher. And many people who heard him were amazed at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority. You see, Jesus taught people about the love of God. And they could see by the things he did and the things that he said that he was an authority. They watched as Jesus healed a man who was sick in his mind and in his heart. 
they saw the power of God's love at work. The best teachers are the ones who really know what they are talking about. And Jesus is the best teacher to teach us about love. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us Jesus, who teaches us so much about love. Help us to learn from him and follow him and do as he does. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading is from the first chapter of Mark, verses 21 through 28. The man was an unclean spirit. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Here ends the reading. I want to thank Susan Brill for reading our scripture. I want to thank Mary Catlett for the hymn selections, and Emily Kuhn for our anthem. Thank you so much for your contribution to worship this morning. I tried once to stand down a bully 
as a fifth grader. Billy, the bully, was two years older, but in our grade due to being held back a few times. He tried to butt in line in, come in front of a couple of my friends while we were playing limbo during an indoor rainy day lunch recess. I tried to intervene to stop this justice. So I stepped in front of Billy, telling him with as much authority as I could muster in my fully grown five foot tall body, I stopped growing at that year, that he'd have to go through me first. He did. He leveled me with one punch before I knew what was happening. It was the first and thankfully the last time I have ever received a punch. <laughs> Apparently, I hadn't been listening to Mr. Rogers' advice about finding a helper when there were bullies around. Billy got in trouble. I learned a lesson. In our text this morning, there is also an encounter between two powers played out not during recess, but in a synagogue on the shore of the Sea of Galilee on the Sabbath day. In just 12 verses, Jesus has been, bapt been baptized by John, tempted in the wilderness by Satan, begun preaching, called his first four disciples, and like all devout Jews, and like us today as devout Protestants and Christians, he went to church on the Sabbath day. There Jesus stands up to read one of the texts for the day, and then he began to teach. And quite literally, all hell breaks loose. We don't know what Jesus said. What we do know is that the people present were amazed at his teaching, for he taught as one with authority. This is the first and not last that dig at the scribes that Jesus will make in this gospel, setting up the tension and the drama that would play itself out all the way to the cross. Scribes were expository teachers. They would dig deeply into the ancient laws and the prophets and various other writings, and then they would try to apply that truth to the present. Jesus, on the other hand, was different. Speaking about newness, about the presence of the kingdom of God right here and right now, and doing so with the authority of God. Jesus' authority was fundamentally different than that of the scribes, in kind and not simply in degree. You see, he is the source of authority. Jesus' words worked with surgical precision, going to the very heart of hearts of the people. Those who heard knew the truth of what he was saying and felt it, experienced it in their gut. Jesus' authority is front and center in the Gospel of Mark, in his teaching, in his works of power, in his confrontations with the temple's self-serving leaders, in forgiving sins, in the works of his disciples, and even from the cross. The demon immediately knows who Jesus is, even though the people who probably ought to have recognized him, especially the scribes, were clueless. The demon states clearly, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And without any grand formula, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit from his baptism, simply tells the demon, be quiet and come out of him. And the evil spirit with convulsions and crying in a loud voice comes out. Edward Bennett Williams, who was a powerful D.C. attorney 
and the former owner of the Baltimore Orioles spoke about that kind of a reality as he lay dying. Someone at his bedside was teasing, about, teasing him about all the power and influence that he had had in Washington. And he said this, power, I'm about to meet real power. That describes Jesus. Shows of power are amazing, awesome, even fearful. Just consider the power of the Colorado River to carve the Grand Canyon. If you've ever had the advantage or privilege of being able to stand at the edge of the viewing area and look down, you will know what, an ama what amazing awe and fear is. Twice in these verses, Mark describes the response of the people as amazed. <laughs> At least this was one sermon that didn't put anyone to sleep. I find it so interesting that this man, possessed of a demon or, or unclean, encounters Jesus right in the heart of the synagogue, right in the middle of a worship service. This man doesn't come in, but is in the synagogue already, one of the people. You see, Jesus is a threat to evil in all of its forms, and sometimes that form is alive and well in congregations. We err in two ways. If we believe there is no such thing as evil, or if we believe that evil is the cause of everything. Like the client that I had years ago as a therapist who was a habitual smoker and she went to a, a religious person who exercised the demon of smoking. I think she had control over that. But we do know that there are things beyond our control. And in particular, things that lead to death. And these are evil. These are forces that go against our life-giving, life-affirming God. In biblical times, there was such concern about purity because it was a way to keep people free of things that might cause death. That seems really meaningful in this time of pandemic, when death literally is in the air. Principalities and powers are forces that corrupt what was intended for good. Just one example would be pharmaceutical companies that create wonder drugs for pain, but neglect to consider the human costs of addictions and want to maintain their bottom line so they can stay in existence. Read the news and you will know that evil is alive and active in our world. It is present in the more obvious forms, systemic racism, economic disparity, environmental degradation, and the bitter battles of partisanship. But it is also alive and well and active in more subtle but none less dangerous ways, in the form of jealousy, envy, gossip, and fear of change. If you don't believe that last one, just talk to me about congregations that have tried to change the color of the walls of their sanctuary, or the color of the carpeting, or the pew cushions, or the worship time. I have stories to tell. The danger in this story is smack dab in the middle of the congregation. And it is there that Jesus performs his first act of publish, public ministry. It's like he's saying, watch out, Jesus, watch out evil. Jesus is on the move and the kingdom of God is here now. There are bookends in the Gospel of Mark. In this first chapter, we have a demon declaring that Jesus is the Holy One of 
God. And then in the next to the last chapter of Mark, we will find a centurion at the crucifixion, maybe even the one who drove the nails into Jesus' hands and feet, who upon seeing Jesus die confesses, surely this man was the son of God. The title of this sermon, What is This?, is taken from the lips of the people who were there that Sabbath day in Capernaum. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, confronts a man full of evil, and there is no match. The people say, what is this? The disciples will ask a similar question when Jesus still, still, stills the storm at sea. Jesus demonstrates power over all things, seen and unseen, the kingdom of heaven redeeming people for whom the society no longer cared. But perhaps a better question, and the one that each of us needs to ask is, who is this? And what will we do about it? We live in a world that is hungry for something deeper, for something that will truly save us from ourselves and the messes we've gotten ourselves into. Yet we fear losing control, even if it is to the one who loved us and chose us to be God's children from before the world was created. I know that there is a part of me that still feels like the fifth grader, hopped up on Mighty Mouse's tiny but mighty hyperactive actions, and Popeye, who by the way had no higher power than spinach. And that didn't end well then for me, and it won't end well now. Who is this disruptive, amazing, grace-filled, loving one who can make all things right by laying down his life for his friends. Jesus, our baptism vows include these words. Do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? We've all said yes to that. And I suspect that we all need reminders about it. And so I encourage us today to say yes again to new life in Christ Jesus, falling on mercy, on the mercy of God's perfect love that can cast out all our fears. May it be so. Amen. In your bulletins, which you can access via email or on our internet. We always have a, a list of people who could use prayers and receive cards. And I would like to name them at the beginning of this prayer and ask that you would join your hearts with me in lifting them to our Lord. And please, if your name is not on this list or someone that you love, please add that name and lift it to God. We pray for the family of Cindy Chrisman Berner, for Martin Cullors, for Carol Zarneski, for Dr. Jerry Germroth, for Randy and Valerie Hockman, for Wes Irvin, for Jake Johnson, for Daniel Ron Caston, for Belkey Lake, for Marcy. Lambert, for Nora Long, for Connie Mance, for Courtney Markham, for Cher Sherry May, for the family of Gary Mark Lee, for Spencer McIntosh, for Jesse Payne, for Craig Smith, for Jack Sullivan, for Pete Wright. Lord, we pray 
your presence and your mercy and your wholeness and healing upon each of these, our beloveds, and all else, those others whom we lift to you in our prayers. God, we know that the voices of the prophets spoke to people long ago who were too busy and anxious to hear you. Their words, though, have streamed through time and come to us today. We need to pay attention to your message offered through them. You are our God, the God of all creation, the God of power and love, whose mercy is offered to us. Jesus, your Son, proclaimed the good news through words and actions, reaching out to those who were troubled, alienated, cast aside. He offered healing and hope to those others turned away. Help us to learn that you alone can heal us and fix those areas in our lives that are wounded and twisted. Help us to understand that you alone can offer to us a new way of life through Jesus Christ. Remind us again that as we have spoken the names of the people and situations that concern us, praying for your healing touch, that that same touch is offered to each of us in Jesus' name. Lord, we need to get, let go of our control issues and place our trust wholly in you, now and forever. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to say a word of thanks to all of the ways that you make offerings of yourself to this congregation and to your families and to the world. And we thank you for the offerings that you have sent to us by check or via Realm or PayPal. We are so grateful for everything that you give and everything that you do. And we lift all of those things up to God for God's glory alone, to change our hearts and to change the hearts of the world. Amen. As we leave from our time of worship and go into the world for service, let us remember that Jesus comes to us offering healing and hope, speaking and acting with authority. Listen to him. Go into this world confident in God's love and healing power. Go in the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the companionship and power and fellowship and comfort of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>